Hello everyone, I'm Brian. Welcome back. Let's go ahead and continue. His, one of his disciples asked him this question. Vivekananda was very pleased with him, a um, young man in Calcutta, as, uh, and said, ask me anything, ask me for anything. And that disciple said, um, tell me what is Maya. Ooh. Vivekananda said, ask me a different question. <laughs> And that disciple wasn't going to let go. He said, having got a guru like you, if I don't understand this mystery, then I will never understand it. I want to know this. Then Vivekananda started speaking, and the disciple has recorded his experiences. He said, as I listened to Vivekananda, the world whirled around me, and as if everything disappeared, I couldn't see the room around me, I couldn't see my own body or Vivekananda also, but only his voice continued. And there was this mass of luminosity which, which was there. After some time, I burst out and said, but you, what, what you are doing, this work of the, of the mon monastery, the Ramakrishna mission and all, it's all Maya. The world is Maya, even the work that you're doing is Maya. And then when he said this, he said, when I said this, I realized in Bengali you use two kinds of words for you, apni and tumi. Apni means thou. Uh, you is respectful, which you would use to a senior, a parent, or a guru. And to me is what you would use to a friend. Uh, all Indian languages have these uh, addresses. And this person, he said it, and then suddenly it struck him, I'm talking to Vivekananda, and I said to me, the way you address somebody, you're equal. The moment he thought this, everything snapped back into uh, into place, the world and room and Vivekananda sitting in front of him and he looked, he was staring at Vivekananda, Vivekananda looked down at him, he was smiling he says that is true, that is true means it is all Maya <coughs> if you can plunge your mind in meditation become one with the, with the divine, with Brahman if you cannot then come and help in this work uh, Vivekananda had said that let all vision cease, let all dream cease or if you cannot then dream but better dreams which are, uh, which are uh, eternal love and service free. Hmm. What is the best possible life to lead? Even when we are not enlightened, in this life, she is eternal love, unconditional love. Doesn't matter what the other person is, what the other person does. Unconditional love. And expressed in my life as service free. I don't want anything in return. Vivekananda said, give, give, and do not look back. Whoever looks back, their ocean dwindles into a drop. His achievements were extraordinary. In this country, he opened the door to the inflow of what, what Sister Nivedita says, the 5,000 years of patient development of spirituality in India. All the accumulated treasures, they began to flow into this country and through in the United States, across the world. Um, Phil Goldberg, in his book, American Veda, he has, he has shown how Vivekananda came, the Vedanta Society. This is the first one. He speaks about this Vedanta Society also. And the next one was in San Francisco. Uh, Vivekananda established that. And the others were established also after this. But not just the Vedanta Societies. He so shows how many teachers, Swamis and Yogis and Lamas, um, Buddhist teachers, Vedanta teachers, Yoga teachers, Bhakti teachers, um, teachers of meditation, even Hatha Yoga. All the yoga studios and uh, all the stretching and asana, all of that, it came in the wake of Vivekananda. And not just the practices, a change in the way we think. Um, Phil Goldberg has a chapter. The Swamis taught the smart guys and the smart guys taught the rest of us. That's the name of the chapter. He talks about, for example, right here in New York, he talks about Salinger, J.D. Salinger, one of the most beloved um, uh, novelists of America who after the war, he, he wrote this, Catcher in the Rye. Uh, so they made a movie about Salinger recently, Rebel in the Rye. Uh, and they showed, coming to the Vedanta Society, the, um, the Ramakrishna Vivekananda Center on the east side, they've shown it very nicely. I saw that, saw that clip just, just to see how they have shown. And they've shown Swami Nikhilananda, uh, very nicely done. Uh, I tried to read uh, catcher in the Rye, but I didn't quite like it. And somebody told me, too late, Swami, you should have read it when you were a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> You're too old for that. <laughs> you have to be a teenager to understand that kind of feeling. Hmm. And uh, he, 
he learned Vedanta very deeply and had a deep personal devotion to Sri Ramakrishna and Maa Sharada and Swami Vivekananda. In the movie, they are very particular, very moving <coughs> scene at the very end uh, where they show that he has become a recluse. He became a recluse because of that. Uh, and uh, he kept on writing. The last scene of the movie, uh, that one I remember, they show that he is in this cottage, Salinger, and writing. Uh, he is sitting in meditation, the picture of Thakur Maa Swamiji in front of him. And then he gets up and then he goes to his writing desk and starts writing and that's the fade out of the, of the uh, movie. <clears throat> when I was talking about how they have deep um, devotion to Sri Ramakrishna, I don't know if I could ever have deep demo devotion to any individual people. So I, I don't think I'll have a deep devotion to say Sadhguru, Acharya Prashant, Swami uh, Sarapyananda or even Swami Taratmananda or any Swamis or Gurus or anything like that. I think my devotion is more along the lines of the people that I can uh, interact with. And it's not to say that I, I devote to all the people I interact with, only the ones who are willing, I suppose, you could say. <clears throat> you could say that's very easy to do. It very much is so. You know, and what I mean by this is that people who are nice and friendly back, you know, I'm nice and friendly with them, versus people who are mean or, or cruel or whatever. I generally, I have not really run into people like that, so I don't know what to say, but I'll, I'll assume that I won't be as devoted to them, I guess you could say. Now, I would probably, if, if possible, to try to talk to them, and just to see where they're coming from and try to convince them otherwise. But you can, uh, I guess the saying for me is that you cannot help someone who's not seeking help. There's a saying, it, it's not quite that, you can't help you can't help those who don't want help. But you can keep trying. A little bit. Hopefully you can wear them out of that. But I guess that's the saying. Is that you can't really help people who do not want help. <clears throat> uh, now, is that completely true? I don't think so. But it is mostly true. I, b I believe that if they are resistant to help... It's going to be very difficult. Is it possible to get through them? Maybe. Every every individual is different. So there are going to be some people who you can push through that and get them help. There are some people who are very resistant, and their best way to help them is by to is to let them go for a little bit, let them do their thing, and then come back at a later time. Everyone's going to be different. And then there are some people who you just can't help. So, anyways, I I think. I think that's me. I don't think I can devote myself necessarily to any individual people, but just more along the lines to the idea of humanity, like uh, like Lakani would say, uh, spiritual humanism, <laughs> the word he likes to say. He wrote that <clears throat> these two classics, Raja Yoga and Karma Yoga, both published, by the way, from the Vedanta Society of New York for the first time. Vivekananda wrote Raja Yoga here in the Vedanta Society, mm. his translation and commentary on the Patanjali Yoga Sutras and Karma Yoga. These two classics, our American youth would do well to carry these two classics around in their pockets. Salinger, his book Franny and Zui, it's full of you know, references to karma and uh, jnana. And in fact, in his own words, there's a copy of Franny and Zui which he presented to um, Nick Swami Nikhilananda. In that, there's a penciled note saying that I wrote this book to spread the ideas of Vedanta. Salinger. Star Wars. Did you know? Who would, who would have thought? George Lucas. George Lucas was friends with Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell gave him many ideas. He was a disciple of uh, Swami Nikhilananda. And you can see many Vedantic ideas in the Star Wars movies. How it spreads across popular culture. That's I'm curious if anyone can break that down. Because I know <clears throat> I know um the Matrix is very heavily influenced by Eastern philosophy. And that's super cool. That is super cool. And don't get me wrong, like it's to say that the first thing I heard is actually that we may be living in a computer simulation, even I think even before the matrix it's possible but we would have never known but the sheer fact that 
Advaita Vedanta teaches that, you know, this is not our real bodies. These, this entire Earth universe are in our experience is Maya. Well, to a degree, perhaps, of our experience is Maya, because what we're experiencing is technically Brahman. So the experience itself is... I wouldn't say it's false, but it's a misunderstanding. That's what I like to say what Maya is, a misunderstanding. We misunderstand the fact that we're all individuals. In reality, that's not true. We're all the same. So, to say that our individual self is false, not really. It's a misunderstanding that our individual selves aren't individual, but we're all one. So, that's what I like to say, anyway. <laughs> I'm still trying to understand, I guess, the bigger Brahman. Like, I have a few understandings of it. I just don't know which one's the the, the correct one, I suppose. I have a, a few understandings of it. But anyways, about the movie, I'm kind of curious as to, I wonder if someone did break it down in terms of what influences uh, did Eastern philosophy have on Star Wars. I'm trying to think. Can't really think. Hmm. The Lion King. <laughs> you see, the, when uh, uh, the lion is being shown his reflection in, in the water and to see who you really are. That's exactly the story that Vivekananda um, tells about the lion cub who grew up not knowing who he was. He was thought he was sheep and he was shown that he's a lion that he realizes I'm the spirit. That's what we are supposed to realize. I'm not body. What sheep means? Body, senses, mind. I'm not these. I am awareness, I am eternal consciousness. Aldous Huxley, Christopher Isherwood, Gerald Hurd, all of them were very close to Swami Prabhavananda Ji in Southern California in, in Hollywood. And look at the product of that. Um, Isherwood wrote that um, one of the most amazing biographies of Sri Ramakrishna, Ramakrishna and his disciples. Right? Uh, even now, when in here and in India, when people recommend a book about Sri Ramakrishna in English, we recommend that one, Ramakrishna and his disciples. It's so well written. A and also, the kind of price some of these people paid for their, uh, for, for their contribution. Isherwood was you know, the darling of the jet set here, intellectual jet set here in, uh, 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 in the East Coast and the West Coast in the United States in the 50s and 60s. And when he wrote that book, some reviews were nasty. Some said that, oh, he's become part of some Hindu cult or something like that, you know. <laughs> But he maintained his association with the Vedanta Society till the very end. Uh, he was very closely connected with the Vedanta Society of Southern California. Aldous Huxley, one of the leading intellectuals in Britain and then, they were all British by the way. Uh, Huxley, Christopher Isherwood, Gerald Hurd, uh, Alan Watts. Alan Watts you know, was not directly connected with uh, uh, Vedanta, but he taught Vedanta and Zen, a kind of eclectic mixture of both. Aldous Huxley, his amazing book, The Perennial Philosophy. Houston Smith, major figure in, in the, the study, com, study of comparative religion, and his book, The World's Religions. He wrote that he was a disciple of Swami Sat Prakashananda in the Vedanta Society in <coughs> St. Louis. I will say this, now that he said world religion, it made me think about the time I took world religion. I do not remember Advaita Vedanta because I don't I don't know if they consider that a religion. I remember Buddhism because that stuck out the most to me. There's a reason why for that too. But I don't remember any other. That's the only thing that I remember from that class. I'm trying to remember if there's any other Eastern philosophy that was taught besides Buddhism. <laughs> uh, world religion, and the only thing I remember is Buddhism. Hmm. So this spread of uh, Vedantic ideas, yogic ideas, ideas of, and then later on Buddhism and so on, that Vivekananda was the, um, was the pioneer. He opened the door here. And he went back to India, the other side of his, of his uh, work. Sister Nivedita writes, when he stood up to speak here in Chicago, he has a message for the West. He said, I have a message for the West as Buddha had a message for the East. But his message, his words, Nivedita writes, traveled back across the dark oceans to a land, to his motherland, asleep, to awaken her to a sense of her greatness. When he went back to India, India which was colonized, which was um, starving, superstitious, divided, he was the first person, historian says, to consistently refer to himself as Indian. Other leaders at that time, they called themselves Bengali or uh, Maharashtrian or Tamil or Punjabi. 
and within a generation within vivekananda generation itself all leaders in india political and thought leaders and you know, writers they were talking of themselves as indian that's patriot patriotism <laughs> can't say the word but that is that is what is very much it right there kind of that's kind of interesting because i remember the first time i heard of anything like this was british britain where i think people i remember watching this um thing on youtube and the reason why I saw it's because, oh yeah, you know, British people don't say that they're African British or anything like that. They say they're British, regardless of their skin color. It's like, man, that's interesting. I wish that was kind of said in America. I'm American. And there are some people out there like that. As a matter of fact, I did watch this one. I think it was a boxer. He says, I'm not African American. I'm American. I love America. And I was like, man. If only we can unite. Now, I'll say this. It's, it, there's nothing wrong saying that you're African American or Asian American or anything like that. However, I think you have to have some knowledge and experience of whatever you're claiming to be to say that you're African American or Asian American or Indian American. You kind of have to be from India, uh, Africa, or um, what is it? Asia. But to say Asian American or African American is very generic, though, because Africa and Asia are not countries. They're the continent. And the reason why they say that is because they don't know where they're from. So how can you say you're African American and don't know where you're from? And I get it. Like, it's great to go look at your history. But I, I think at that point, you're so far separated from your original, from your I won't say your birth country because you're born in America. If you're if you're born in America, that I think you start. I think people should start considering themselves American. Kind of like how um, Swami Vivekananda here. He was born in India, and it is a country trying to unite itself, according to at least what I'm hearing here. They're all separate people, but Swami Vivekananda was trying to unite Indians to be saying, "I'm Indian." Again. I would never say there's anything wrong if you're saying you're Bengali or like uh, or uh, or whatever other country or state, depending on I don't know how much India was broken up at the time. But to say that I am something Indian would be, or some, say something American, say um, actually I don't know what you would say honestly because America is a little bit different. Um, I guess the equivalent would be a state. Anyways, let me just go to India here. Uh, say Bengali Indian, because he, they were originally from Bengali, and Bengali was probably its own country at a time before it was united under India. I don't know. I'm guessing here, but I'm, but the whole point is is the fact to say that you're Bengali Indian is because you are in fact Bengalian. I, again, I'm hoping I'm saying this correctly, but please understand the point I'm trying to say more so than the words. <laughs> But because you are this and you are Indian, now imagine if uh, if uh, a family from America moved over to India, and now they're five generations into India, and they're still sitting there saying, "Oh, I'm American Indian," which actually would be kind of confusing because they're Indians in America. <laughs> I am. Oh, that would be confusing. But anyways, you get my point. Like to say that no, you you're born you're you're. You're kind of far removed from America. You, you're you living in India for a couple of generations now. You are, hopefully you will say that you're an Indian and not have the separation. <clears throat> because, and maybe you can say you're a Bengali Indian, even though you're a white person in uh, India. Because <laughs> you've lived there and you are born there. And this is the kind of, another political issue that I have with people saying, oh, um, you know, white people are, you know, as though they didn't live here or born here. Yeah, they came over here much like the Native Americans. They they weren't, they didn't manifest in America. They actually, from according to what I remember in history class, they walked across the ice bridge from, I believe, in Alaska and made their way down following the buffaloes, or the mammoths, sorry, the mammoths maybe, to America. And that's how they came to America. So they immigrated as well or our colonizers as well to some degree but you get my point anyways weird way off topic he i would say kick-started the indian national movement which finally led to the freedom of india now they said we are celebrating the 75 years 
uh, of Indian freedom. Uh, whether it is Pandit Nehru, the first Prime Minister of independent India, who said that uh, in my generation we all read Vivekananda. And I would urge the, uh, the youth of today, this is after Indian indep independence, uh, to read Vivekananda. Do Dr. Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan, the philosopher and president of India who was um, at Harvard University, I saw the Center for Study of World Religions, was inaugurated by Dr. Radhakrishnan in 1950s, I think, late 50s. He was uh, inspired by Vivekananda, down to the, uh, our present Prime Minister Modi, from his uh, youth onwards, is inspired by Vivekananda. So the tremendous effect of Vivekananda on India and the West, this was the power that was unleashed. He came from a region of luminosity, a region of light, luminosity, our real nature, his real nature, our real nature. And he came to give us that message. Not just a separate message of spirituality, but a global message which includes not just spirituality, not just religion, but science and art and, and human civilization as such. And what he has given us is we are just beginning to see the working out of that in this world today, whether in India or here. And in the centuries ahead, we will not be alive, but people will keep on seeing what happens. I am sure, I am sure, as the decades and centuries roll past, all the great figures, good and bad, of the 20th century, of the 19th century, will diminish and fade away into history. And Vivekananda will stand taller and taller and taller. When people look back 100 years, 200 years, 500 years from now, into back into history, the first figure they will find is Vivekananda. I am sure of it. I can see it happening. I'm not prophetic, but <laughs> <laughs> on this day, I pray to Sri Ramakrishna, Masharada, Swami Vivekananda to bless us all. We have come here. Sri Ramakrishna says, "Those who come here, it is their last birth." They will attain freedom in this life. What does it mean coming here? Sri Ramakrishna also says one more thing. That if they like the teachings of this place, he would refer to himself as this place. If they like the teachings of this place. That is the meaning of coming here. So we are here. Yes, we say we like the teachings. <laughs> we like what you say. We like this, this view of life and spirituality and humanity. We pray to Thakur Ma and Swamiji to bless us all to give us viveka and vairagya, uh, to fill our hearts with, with courage, with peace, with joy, and give us, by their grace, that vision of that infinite nature of, of reality and of our, ourselves in this very life itself. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Parnamastu Okay, that's quite a big claim he made at the end there. About, say, 500 years from now, <clears throat> that Swami uh, Vivekananda will still t stand the test of time. I mean, he is so far. Um, so long as the order keeps going, I don't know. I mean, and I don't know if anyone... That's a, that's a big asking, honestly, considering that the fact that it seems like civilized... Well, not civilization, but people are deteriorating, as in they're becoming more and more self-centered more than more than ever before but then again i don't know that could be just that could be just social media <laughs> I'll, uh, i remember seeing on youtube saying you know the dec well, i won't say the decline but people have become more and more how do i say ar arrogant um, self-centered through social media and i do not blame social media i do not blame social media at all Social media is but a tool. We can choose to use it however we want. It's up to you on how you use it. If you get suckered in by all the other people on there being vain, then that's a problem with you showing your true, well, not necessarily your true self, but your, your true self. <laughs> and I think it kind of reveals, I suppose, the human nature of humans. <laughs> it reveals something about us as humans. There we go. <laughs> the human nature of humans, indeed. But, uh, 
I don't know. That seems to be growing a lot faster than Swami Vivekananda's teachings. <laughs> That's kind of bad. That is terrible. Uh, I can only imagine what would life be like in, I don't know, say, uh, really 500 years, honestly. What, what kind of people we will become? Will the teachings of Swami uh, Vivekananda stand the test of time? Or will it be destroyed by social media? Not because social media is actively destroying it, but because we are vain enough, arrogant enough to fall for it. <clears throat> to create... Some, no, 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 not to fall for it. To create something that we fall for. And what I mean by that is that, again, social media is just like any other tool. Any other tool that we can choose to use it however we want. It does not do anything. It is not inherently good or bad. It's how we choose to use it, which makes... I won't say make it good or bad, but <laughs> which makes our our use of it good or bad. I guess that's the right word for it. Oh, man. I, I guess this... Uh, and, the, and the thinking that people saying that social media is to blame are not taking responsibility for their actions. It's a bit harsh. I know I know a lot of people who blame social media. I did at one point to some degree. I did. I said, oh, it's social media's fault. The reason why people like this. Eh, not really. <laughs> Bad. Nah. But uh, it's not, it's not. again, social media is a tool. That's all it is. <clears throat> and how we choose to use it, how we choose to interact with it, will determine what it becomes. Not necessarily what it becomes, but uh, how we respond to it, I suppose. Because it will always be what it is. People will have some control over it, of course, and can swing in a certain direction for sure. But it's up to us whether we fall for it or not. We fall for the illusion that we create. We fall for this, I won't say fake narrative, but this narrative that we create, whether it be fake, true, or whatever. <clears throat> and what I mean by that is when... Uh, the thing, The one thing I see is... Uh, or see on YouTube and stuff is that, especially in the the red pill or in those kind of communities. I don't really I, I follow them because they make some good points, but there are some also be careful points there too. It can become arrogant, but uh, what is it? Oh, uh, it's people who see the glamorous life of people and expect that to be reality. So when they don't, they don't have that in their life, they become arrogant. Or when you see people saying they demand this and demand that, it's like, oh, I should be like that. I demand this. I demand that. It's this growing arrogance, this growing vanity, this growing greed, this growing selfishness. Man, how did we go from Swami Vivekananda to this nasty stuff? <laughs> But I guess it goes back to what uh, Swami uh, Sarvapriyananda here is talking about, how Swami Vivekananda's teachings will hopefully stand the test of time. I worry about that, honestly, because it, it is it's uh, social media, not, it's, not necessarily its fault, but the people who are following it and becoming really arrogant <laughs> seems to be beaten out on it. At least from my perspective, it seems that way. I don't know if it's true or not. It just seems that way. <laughs> Anyways, that's my reaction to Swami Vivekananda, the power and the glory. If you like the content, please consider subscribing. Thumbs up, thumbs down, down below. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next vid.